Hurry. Doctor, where have you been? I've little time to play hide and seek with new staff members, no matter how illustrious they may be. I apologize, nurse. You delivered poor Mr. Hampton from a terrible fate. The means to that end should be of little concern, Doctor. Thank you, nurse. What can I do for you? Dr. Swansea insisted we provide you a quiet office. You'll find it on the second floor with your name on the door. Thank you. Nurse Crane, isn't it? Yes, Dorothy Crane. Welcome to Pembroke Hospital, Dr. Reed. Your office has been prepared. I would like to ask a few questions first. And Mr. Hampton, the patient we brought in, how does he fare? I gave him a sedative to help him sleep. Poor thing was in quite a state of shock. What kind of man is Dr. Swansea? Well, you accepted the job from him. I thought you would have known about your employer. It's right to assume Dr. Swansea knows far more about me than I do about him. You'll get to know him soon enough, and better than me. The Administrator has better things to do than mix with us. Apologies, I've only just met him the once. This is sudden. I've only just returned to England. Dr. Swansea is a brilliant surgeon and the most compassionate physician. If you could point me in the direction of my room again, nurse. Second floor of the hospital, left after the stairs. It's the last vacant office at the end of the corridor. Thank you, Nurse Crane. Dr. Swansea is right. This place seems perfect to conduct my research. Good evening, Doctor. I believe we're going to be working together. Dr. Reed. Dr. Swansea informed us of your arrival, but I could not dare to believe we'd have such good fortune. Such an honor, sir. <laughs> Thank you. And you are? I am Thoreau Strickland. Dr. Thoreau Strickland. I'm a great admirer of your work, Dr. Reed. Please, could you tell me something about yourself? I'm a great admirer of your work concerning blood transfusion, Dr. Reed. I run my own experiments. I'm convinced it's the future. I based my technique on my mentor's research. He helped me perfect my method. What is yours? I'd rather not talk about it. For now, it's just theories and first approach. 
My process is purely experimental and unsuccessful. As long as you're cautious and methodical, you may remain empty. It, but you won't fail. You're not the first one to warn me, but I am convinced knowledge is the main weapon against the ravages of this epidemic. What made you choose to be a doctor? I'm not ashamed to admit you and your work have inspired me. I am honored to have the opportunity to work by your side. I'll give you some advice, but understand that nothing beats practical experience which can be exhausting and solitary work. Of course, sir. And don't worry, I will never allow myself to be a burden, uh, neither to you nor this hospital. What can you tell me about the Pembroke? Well, it has always been an honor to work with Dr. Swansea. But with your arrival, I can't think of a better opportunity to learn about blood transfusion. You seem quite optimistic. It's a rare and precious attitude in these difficult times. I'm convinced that this epidemic is a test. A test of endurance and dedication for us men of science. Questions remain about our capacity to resolve the situation. True, true. Last summer, during the first wave of the epidemic, I used to joke with Milton about the extra work. We're not smiling now. Do you need help with anything in particular? Well, yes, maybe. I'm waiting for a batch of products I ordered for my personal research, yet my supplier seems to have vanished. Do you want me to play the errand boy for you? Oh no, Dr. Reed. But if you went personally to his shop, what with your reputation and all, he wouldn't dare to refuse the products I need. I see. Well, give me the address, for I may pass by if I have time. about your willingness to experiment with new medical techniques. Harvey Fiddick is a patient suffering from a severe injury that could cripple him if not treated correctly. I'm convinced your blood transfusion technique could help him. What is it you really want? To save him or to prove your point? Fair question. I want nothing but to save my patient, Dr. Reed, especially since I know Mr. Fiddick's story. Tell me Mr. Fiddick's story. Our first diagnosis was compromised because Mr. Fiddick lied to us about the real origin of his injury. He first claimed it was an accident. But why would he hide such crucial information from us? Because he is a proud father, ashamed of putting his children at risk because of his own negligence. This personal involvement could also appear to be a lack of impartiality. You must know that a good surgeon must remain neutral. I agree. 
But that does not excuse Dr. Ackroyd's behavior, a man who did not even take time to converse with his patient. Do you think keeping his distance was a mistake? All I know is that I'm taking care of human beings with desires, hopes, and fears, not some biological machine comprised of blood, bones, and flesh. Goodbye, Dr. Strickland. This hospital seems to be falling apart. Good evening, sir. Good evening, madam. Can I help you? It's my son who needs you, sir. I'm Dr. Jonathan Reed. How can I help your son? I'm Beatrice Goswick, mother of Mortimer Goswick. Could you check on him, please, Dr. Reed? I've heard much of your talents as a physician. What can you tell me about yourself, Mrs. Goswick? Not much to say. Just take care of my Mortimer and I'll cover all the expenses. That's all that matters. Are you really that rich? Most of the patients here are of a more humble origin, if I may say so. Yes. Thanks to my husband. May he rest in peace. I can cover any needed medical expenses. May I ask if you have an occupation, Mrs. Goswick? I'm a teacher by profession. I teach young women who are more ambitious about their futures than their families. What do you think of your reception here? Any complaints? I have had the uttermost reservations about this hospital since we arrived. But we had no other choice, considering the state of emergency. Is there something in particular that's bothering you? Some of the staff were not... especially welcoming. I suspect they're not accustomed to dealing with patients of such social standing. Tell me more about your arrival at the Pembroke Hospital. What gave you such a bad first impression? The ambulance driver was quite rude, for a start. And that nurse, Miss Hawkins, seems to have quite a dubious attitude. What do you mean? She managed to secure a bed for my son despite the epidemic. It was a relief. But it wasn't cheap. I share your concern, Mrs. Goswick. Be sure that I'll talk to the people involved. I don't expect compensation, Dr. Reed. But I'm aware such behavior would not be tolerated in other hospitals. She charged you for a bed? Yes, and I paid without question, considering the urgency of the situation. Goodbye, Mrs. Goswick. My sweet girl. Good evening. I'm Dr. Reed. Can I help at all? No. Really? Why are you here, then? I don't want to talk. My throat hurts too much. I suppose that this pain is the reason you're here. Is someone taking care of you? Yes. And no. Could you at least tell me your name, sir? Mortimer. Mortimer Goswick. How painful is your throat, Mr. Goswick? So painful I'd rather not talk at all, Doctor. I'm sure you realize a doctor and his patient have to communicate, sir. Would it help if I gave you some paper and a pen? Not really. I see. Then maybe it's not just your throat that hurts, Mr. Goswick. Perhaps your sore throat is just the consequence of something more hurtful. Yes, maybe. But I don't want to talk or even write about it now. Why did your mother have you hospitalized here? She seems convinced this is a bad hospital. My mother just wants the best for me. She won't rest while I'm here. She'd go all the way to hell and back to help me.
Pembroke Hospital may look unorthodox, but rest assured, you're in good hands here. It's not me you have to convince, Dr. Reed. It's my mother. Is your mother bothering you? As your doctor, I can ask her to leave you alone if you would prefer. That's tempting, Doctor. But you have no idea what my mother is capable of. She would tie herself to my bed if you asked her to leave. How painful is your throat, Mr. Goswick? So painful I'd rather not talk at all, Doctor. I'll let you get some rest, then. I'm all right. Don't waste your time with me. Good evening, sir. I'm Dr. Reed. May I help you? I don't know if a third opinion is needed. Your colleagues are already arguing about my condition. I see. Would you mind telling me more about your situation? I'm Harvey Fiddick. All I want is to get me bloody arm fixed properly. Tell me about the doctors who are arguing about your case. Strickland and Aykroyd. They both want the best for me, but there's a lot of pride there. Doctors are no different from carpenters, it seems. What do you mean? I often had professional arguments with rivals on a building site. Difference is, I disagreed about wooden nails, not flesh and bones. Are you satisfied with your treatment here? Well, it's clear that I've chosen a bad time to be injured. Forgive my bluntness. But you seem overwhelmed by cases of the flu. I won't lie to you about it. I'm afraid we are. Are you sure you don't want to operate yourself, Dr. Reed? I have the feeling you're very capable. And your colleagues seem to think so too. In other circumstances, you would be right. But for now, I don't think I can take on the responsibility. My apologies. Tell me about yourself, Mr. Fiddick. I'm just a regular guy waiting to get his arm fixed. So I can return to work. And to my family. I was more curious about what you were doing before being hospitalized. I'm a carpenter. And a good one, too. But that means I need both arms to feed my family, Dr. Reed. Tell me about your injury, Harvey. Why do you feel so guilty about it? My wife died because of me. And now I may lose everything because I've been careless enough to hurt myself. What an arsehole. You can't hold yourself responsible for your injury, Mr. Fiddick. Unless you tried to hurt yourself. Of course I didn't hurt myself. But I can't work until my arm is fixed. My children need to eat, Doctor. How could your job be responsible for your wife's death? I was working a double. She went out to bring me a hot meal and got caught in a German bomb raid. Tell me more about the death of your wife, Harvey. 1915. I was in the army. Building workshops for the Royal Flying Corps. Helen was happy I wasn't sent to the front. What happened? The Germans sent Zeppelins to bomb the construction site, but they missed their target. My wife was bringing my dinner when the bombs fell. How are your children after losing their mother? They were smaller then. The only good thing about this is my Helen didn't bring them with her that night. I'm sorry for your loss. So many died during the bombings. I served in France and witnessed the carnage there. I would like to say that she didn't suffer. Truth is, I have no idea. I just know that I'm all that me kids have. Poor little bleeders. Thank <laughs> you.
Goodbye for now, Mr. Fiddick. I'll see you later. I will not let you down, my boy. This must be the place. It's definitely away from prying eyes. Relegated to the shadows. A kingdom of my own. At least I won't be sleeping in a coffin. The flower's dying. It needs water.
William Bishop's blood is much more unstable than human blood and shows extensive mutation. But this is not what happened to me. I must keep on searching. The sun is about to rise. I can feel it. I'll continue tomorrow night. I have so much time. If I'm to stay here until my research is complete, I'd better learn to hide my true nature from the mortals. But what about my thirst for blood? <laughs>